Um, I wanted to welcome everybody here. Thank you very much for coming out tonight and joining us in the beautiful 1827 barn. Hopefully you've gotten to look around at some of the cool um, elements and our old artifacts and whatnot. I always love being in here. Um, my name is Kim Neeland. I'm our community engagement manager here at the farm, uh, as well as I've got a couple other hats. You've probably seen me bopping around the fields throughout the last four years in different manners. Um, I started in the fields and now uh, doing a bunch of other things, including organizing the speaker series. Uh, so I see a lot of familiar faces, but definitely plenty that I don't know. Um, just curious, how many people it, it's their first time here. Wow, awesome. That's so great to have this. It was, we've got like 50-50 here. No, great. <laughs> yeah, no, so I mean, I don't wanna go on too much about uh, you know talking about the farm because we could go on for hours. This could be the lecture, uh, talking about all the different things that the farm is doing. But for those of you guys who haven't been here before, I wanna give you a quick snapshot of, you know, day to day, what's going on here, because Wrightlock Farm is super vibrant place. Um, I feel really special to be um, a part of this nonprofit organization. Uh, this farm is a working organic farm with a long and rich history, uh, basically established in 1638, been going for a long time now. Uh, but more recently, uh, 2007 was when this farm became the entity that it is uh, being a space for the community to come in. It's open to the public. So again, if you guys want to come back, you're always welcome to, during daylight hours, come see our fields, our goats, our chickens, our sheep, come to the farm stand. This space is, we want to share it with you. Uh, but there's so many things going on on this pretty small parcel of land uh, we have on any given day. You'll see our farmers out in the fields. Uh, they're harvesting for one of three farmers markets, our CSA shares, um, as well as the farm stand that I also manage. And uh, we've got a really blooming um, flower operation now. It's getting really exciting uh, with the uh, hard work of uh, Ruth Chamarchi, who's here, our flower manager. And so now you're seeing gorgeous bouquets at all of our markets, and we're also so uh, happy to have a CSA flower share as well. Um, you'll see, I mean, just today we had 30, 40 kids running around for our youth education programs. Earlier this week, there was yoga going on right where you're all sitting. There was an herb workshop. We've got canning and jamming and uh, backyard chicken workshops. We've got a lot of things going on in our education department and agriculture in our events. We're doing uh, community events uh, like our family farm night, if anybody's been to that. Tomorrow, we're going to have over probably a thousand people on that hillside that you probably walked down. Uh, and we'll have our free, it's a free concert series called Family Farm Night and it's just a blast. And it's really amazing in the four years that I've been here to grow with the farm, but see it grow and change. And what I've seen is every season, there's mo something more and more, more and more is happening. And also the community engagement and involvement is more. It's, there's a, a desire that I feel growing to be a part of this space and the important things that we have here and uh, really the lessons that can be learned from being outdoors, seeing where your food comes from, and especially when we're talking to parents and the kids, just what the kids are learning here about biology, ecology, um, you know, just observing the natural world, nutrition, their cooking. It's a really neat space. So, People are hungry to create positive and healthy change, to connect with the outdoors, and it's going to be really necessary to keep facilitating that kind of uh, education, I think, as you know, we're starting to see these really big long-term problems that our society is going to face. And which brings me here to tonight um, with the speaker series. Uh, education, I think, is vitally important for change as well as creating a healthy community. And uh, Wrightlock Farm, I think one of our main assets that we have to give here is education. Um, and so we're really starting to think big, think more, we're broadening our horizons, thinking about how we can be a really great resource to the community, not just the surrounding towns, but now more of 
you know, Boston. We're the one of the closest farms into Boston. And so we've got this unique opportunity to potentially be like an educational food hub here in Boston. And um, so this season we have five speakers uh, throughout the series. Um, and next, next year I'm hoping to make it bigger and better. We've already got almost filled this whole space, which is really exciting, but also a little bit eerie because we're going to outgrow this space. So I'm going to let you in on a little bit of, uh, on a, little bit of a secret that's, um, we're soon to be embarking on a uh, capital campaign for a new education center here, um, which we're really excited about but I think it's really important for this area and it's really going to expand our educational impact. We already do so much, but this is really going to like double what we're able to do. Uh, we'll be able to reach more different groups that could really use Right Lock Farm, really need this space. Um, and uh, it'll encourage innovation and ensure the farm's long time ability to nurture the generations to come. So we have literature and posters out. Take a look whenever you get a free chance, or if you come back to the farm, grab some pieces of information, ask us any questions. But we're getting really excited um, to have, to really start pushing the envelope that way. We want to be a thought leader of this wonderful area and region. So in that same spirit of pushing the envelope, tonight we'll be talking about the future and sustainability of our food system. So. Our speaker, Molly Anderson, is the William R. Kennan Jr. Professor of Food Studies at Middlebury College in Vermont, where she teaches about hunger and food security, fixing food systems, and sustainability. She's involved in the food system planning at all levels, uh, regionally with her participation in um, the New England uh, Food Solutions New England, to her work with the National Interinstitutional Network of Food, Agriculture, and Sustainability, as well as her membership in the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems. It's a pretty nice list there. We're really happy to have her. Um, but before teaching at Middlebury, Molly was a professor at College of the Atlantic in Bar Harbor. And before that, she actually lived just down the road. And she is also the founding director of the Tufts University Agriculture, uh, Food and the Environment graduate, graduate Program. So again, we couldn't be more happy to have her here. It just makes a lot of sense. She's back back home in a way. Um, and uh, really, I, I gave her a tour of this space because she used to drive past this area when it was not the farm that it is now. And it was really nice to show her what we've done. So anyways, it is my pleasure to welcome you, Molly, to the stage. And Thank you, Kim. And it is so, so exciting to me to see what people have made of this farm. When Kim said, um, I, I live close by, I was right on the edge of Arlington Winchester on Lawrence Lane. It's one, one block over. Uh, and I drove by this place hundreds of times and thought, oh, how sad. It's such a beautiful farm and they're just letting it go. And now, look. This is phenomenal. So congratulations to all of you. I'm really proud of what you have done with the support of the Winchester community and other people from around. And let me just say, it's an honor to be one of your speakers, but also a tremendous honor to have some of my very first students from the Agriculture, Food, and Environment Program who showed up tonight to come out and provide um, moral support. I'm, I'm never sure why they call it moral support. It's, it's not as if I'm planning to do anything immoral if, if you weren't here, but maybe it's a, a kind of a slip on morale. But you really are supporters of my morale and you've been good friends and good supporters throughout my professional career. So let me tell you about this New England food vision that I worked on. The New England Food Vision, in short, is to provide 50% of the food that we consume in New England by the year 2060, and to provide that healthy food for everyone, not leaving out a soul in New England, and to provide it in such a way that communities are restored by having good jobs, 
Um, the environment is restored, oceans are restored. You probably know that oceans are in pretty serious trouble these days. So in short, that's our vision. It was inspired by an earlier book that Brian Donahue, who is our, our leader, he's still at Brandeis University running the American Studies program. He had worked on this, this book called Wildlands and Woodlands that talks about how New England can retain 70% of its land and forest, which is what we really need to protect waterways and to protect the ecological integrity of New England. We're, we're not quite there now, but he pulled together this group of people. Uh, Joanne Burke, who's at University of New Hampshire, uh, did most of the dietary analysis on the vision. I was at College of the Atlantic at the time. Other people, Amanda Beal is still at University of New Hampshire, but she's also the executive director of Maine Farmland Trust. So several of us have moved on to other things. Mark Lapping retired from the Muskie School of Public Service. And Russell Libby unfortunately passed away uh, right before this New England Food Vision was published, but we dedicated it to him because he was such an inspiring pioneer of positive, healthy change in the New England food system. He was the executive director of MAFCA, the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association, for years. So the New England food vision is a little bit different, and let me make sure that we're all on the same page here as we get started. It's a regional vision, and people tend to get very excited about local food systems. We hear a lot about supporting local farmers and eating local food. And if you go into almost any grocery store these days, and this has changed since I first moved to the Boston area, you would never see signs that said locally grown, in, uh, especially in a standard like a stop and shop or um, a, a Shaw's or one of the, the mainline supermarkets. But now locally grown has so much cachet that Time Magazine called it the new organic, that local is even more important to people than organic food. And local does have a lot of benefits. It has the shortest shipping distance. For what that's worth, we're, we're emitting fewer greenhouse gas emissions by getting our food. There are definitely economic benefits to the growers who live in your locality who we want to be supporting. It tends to be freshest if the food is properly harvested and taken care of between harvest and plate, uh, like the food that we enjoyed for dinner here. And I'm, I'm sure that some of you uh, showed up for the dinner too. And it has the advantage of allowing people to overcome that distance between producers and consumers that really afflicts our food system. People are disengaged from their food system overall. It's one of the, the problems with our food system now. But if we expand to a regional food system, then we can be supplying a much greater variety of foods, and we have the benefits of getting foods that are grown in the southern part of this, the region earlier than we can get them here in Boston, and they stay in season if we're, we're shipping in things from Maine, eating things from northern parts of the region, our supply lasts a lot longer. And especially if we're using season extenders, that, that even adds to it. There's also the potential to raise a lot more food and raise a lot more food with that regional stamp on it so that we can be sourcing to big institutions like the Boston uh, School Food Service, which imagine if we were serving regional food to all the kids in all of the school food systems around here, imagine what that would do for farmers. They would have a stable market. They could depend on it. The one disadvantage of institutional sourcing is that institutions want to pay lower prices usually than restaurants or people are willing to pay at farm stands. But the reliability of an institutional source makes up for it. And there are other advantages too. Being able to provide healthy food for all of the kids in school systems all around 
is an amazing benefit. And also, this I think will become far more important in time. A regional food system has greater resilience. We can be providing food that's grown close to home, and I would say get your food from as close to home as you can get it, but if you can't get it from right here near Boston, then go out and get it from one of the states that are close by. And if you can't get it from there, then go on out a little further and be looking for farmers who are using environmentally sound practices at each stage. So here's what's happening with the number of farms and the land in farms. I just wanted to uh, show you a few facts about where we are right now with our food system. Maine is the king as, as far as number of farms, but Massachusetts comes in pretty close. And then Vermont, even though Vermont is quite small, we have a lot of farms. The 2012 numbers in number of farms went up a little bit. This, these are numbers from the agricultural census, which comes out about every five years. And the numbers were a little higher for both land and farms and number of farms for 2012 than they had been in 2007. A lot of people looked at those numbers and said, this is wonderful. We have finally reversed that downward trend, which you can see here. This is what's been happening since 1910. That's the first point in the chart. And then over here is the 2012 census, where we're down to 35,000, a little under 35,000 farmers. And as I mentioned earlier, Maine is the highest. And then we come in with Massachusetts and Vermont close behind. But we have seen a drastic drop in the number of farms and the amount of farmland in New England uh, since 1910 with a particularly acute drop, you can see that point where the main just falls off the cliff about the middle of the last century. As tractors started coming in and as kids had every motivation in the world and were being told it's only stupid kids who stay on the farm. If you're smart, make something of yourself, get out, go into the city and get a good job. Fortunately, people are starting to look at that a little bit differently and realizing that growing our food is a very honorable job and it's a completely necessary job, especially as we look at the future. So this is what's happened and that drop falling off the cliff happened in every New England state. <coughs> this is what happened with farmland. The chart down at the bottom is showing... Um, the, the ag census is starting in 1982. And the red is where there was a drop in farmland. The green is where farmland actually increased in that census. So it's not quite as drastic a picture as we could see with the number of farmers. What happened in New England is that the larger farms bought out their neighbors. So they became even larger. We have a lot more huge farms now than we used to. And huge farms by New England standards are still kind of kind of small uh, by national standards. Partly because of our terrain, it just doesn't lend itself really to giant farms and giant farm equipment, those massive combines that are uh, you, you know, as, as high as this barn. You, you could not find a field, I think, in New England that, that would be worth investing in that kind of combine to work because you, you couldn't turn it around. It, it would just sit there in the field. Uh, not, not much of a return on your investment. So anyway, the amount of farmland did decrease, but it has started to come back up. And you can see a slight uh, tick up, especially for Maine and Massachusetts um, and Vermont, actually, with the 2012 census, starting with 2007. And that's because of this resurgence in interest in farming. It's not a back to the land movement, really. Uh, it's not a repeat of what happened in the 1960s where a lot of kids were, were um, fed up with the establishment. <laughs>